If you'll find Colossians chapter 1, the Holy Spirit would call our attention to verses 9 through 12 this morning. It's a positive passage, it's a healthy passage, and it's one that each of us can benefit from. It might call us to reflect, but for the most part, he's calling, uh, the Holy Spirit is encouraging us in our Christian journey. So as you're finding that, uh, let me mention, uh, you saw our video for, from our Ecuador trip, great trip, hear more about it tonight, but be in prayer for our brothers and sisters there. It's a third world country, it's a little congregation, a village church out in the, the countryside areas. They're struggling. After they came out of COVID, everyone who had an excuse not to go to church used it, and most of them didn't come back. So while the church was starting to grow a little bit, they're back down essentially to their their founding group, and they're struggling with that. There's also some cultural oppression, some spirit, it's really spiritual. It's principalities of evil using the culture to press down upon the church, and they admitted to us that they're struggling with some of those things. So we'll be going back soon, not sure when yet, but come back tonight. I do want to appreciate uh, and to express my gratitude to Buck for filling in the last two Sundays. I told him last week after listening to him uh, preach that he's the cleanest expositor I know. And what I mean by that is it's clear that he goes right from the scripture, explains what it means, and then brings it right into your life and mine in a way that I can understand. And if I can understand, anybody can understand, believe me. So thank you, Buck, for doing that, and uh, we're so glad to have he and and Vicki with us. I was at their church yesterday for a funeral, their former church in Douglasville, and they kept saying they wanted him back. And I said, you're not getting him back. It'll be over my dead body that you get him back. So We're happy to have such a gift uh, to our church. Colossians 1, verses 9 through 12, the title of this message is Our Church's Vision Statement, Know, Grow, Go. The full vision statement of our congregation is this, making God's glory our passion in order to lead others to know Christ, grow in Christ, and go for Christ. It begins with worship, making God's glory our passion. That's why this moment, this hour, is the most important hour of our week. And out out of the outflow of that worship, we have a deeper desire to know Christ, to grow in Christ, and to go for Christ. We say it in short form, know, grow, and go, but it's really more than a slogan. It's a biblical statement of truth. It's a biblical statement of discipleship, and it is what Paul prays for the Colossians in verses 9 through 12. One interesting thing before we read, he um, not only prays for them, but he tells them specifically what the content of his prayer is. He said, well, why is this? Why didn't he just say, uh, I'll be praying for you and then get on to the, the weightier matters? It's because he wanted them to align their lives to what he was praying, that they would know Christ, that they would grow in Christ, and that they would go out into the world for Christ. So oftentimes what I'll do before I read is I'll I'll point out a couple of technical things in the actual text. The reason I do this is not to impress anyone. That would be a waste of your time and mine. No one's here to impress anyone. The reason that I do that is because I want you to trust what God says in His Word, not what I say with my lips. In fact, I want you to to judge what I say. I want you to think critically about what I say, because I stand before you trying my best to accurately represent what God has written. And so with that said, the governing verb in this passage, verses 9 through 12, is walk. It dictates everything else, it governs, it drives everything else around it. It's found actually in verse 10. 
And then coming off of the word walk, we all know what that means. It means to live day by day in obedience to Christ. It means to walk every day in obedience. But coming off of that are four participles, and they essentially become the outline for us today. Bearing fruit, that's what it means to walk in Christ. Bearing fruit, increasing in spiritual knowledge, verse 10. Strengthened with power, verse um, 10, and then giving thanks in verse 12. Strengthened is in verse 11. But you get the idea. Paul wants us to walk with Christ. That means you must know Him. That means you must grow in Him. And that means you must go for Him. And that will be how we go this morning. So let me read this, and then we'll jump right into it. Verse 9. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Let's stop for a moment and pray. Father, we come before you with the the book uh, laid bare before us, and you have spoken. You've spoken to us from Proverbs about gaining wisdom and knowledge, and we've responded in kind with prayer and confession to you, confession that we need your spiritual wisdom and understanding to make this Christian journey profitable. And Father, we come having heard Uh, your word in the New Testament and responded in song. And now let us hear and understand these words, how to know you more deeply, to grow in you more deeply, and then to go for you out into this world who so desperately needs you. Empower us, we pray by your Spirit, and we pray it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So know the right way. Colossians 1 verse 9a says, And so from the day we heard, we being the Apostle Paul, he names Timothy also in verse 1, and there were other Christian saints with him at the time he wrote this in jail. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will. That's where we get know. You must know the right way. Knowledge. Know. There are actually two words that set the, corner for this, the cornerstone for this prayer. Those are the words knowledge in verse 9 and will in verse 9. The word knowledge in Greek actually Uh, has a prefix attached to it. It's epi, which intensifies the word knowledge, and it's talking about a deep and thorough knowledge. In fact, I don't know if there's any way Paul could have emphasized it more unless he just repeated the word several times. But he's saying, I want you not just to know about Christ, I want you to know Him in an intimate and a spiritual way. And then the word will. I want you to know His will In other words, know his desires, know his passions, know what pleases him, know in any given situation how he would have you respond, not how you would have you respond. That's the word will. It's the same as in verse chapter 1. Verse 1, it means his resolute determination. It is what God desires of Christian saints. And so we bring it all together and, and we need to know the right way, knowledge and knowledge of the right way, His will. Some months ago, I remember in a Bible study speaking of the several wills of God. I wasn't teaching it, I was sitting and being taught, but uh, 
we had several mentioned his revealed will, God's revealed will, God's uh, secret will, God's permissive will, and there are several others that might have been mentioned. Someone rose up and said, I don't believe that. I believe God has one sovereign will, and his one sovereign will always comes to pass. A spirited but friendly debate ensued. Everyone was civil, and we were discussing the Word of God. But we have to ask ourselves the question, who's correct there? The answer is, in a sense, both are correct. God has one will, but it is a multifaceted will. John Calvin puts it this way. We don't always agree with Calvin on everything, but here he's absolutely right. But John Calvin says, while in himself the will is one and undivided, to us it appears manifold because from the feebleness of our intellect we cannot comprehend how. There you have it if you want to read it for yourself. But essentially what Calvin is saying is God has one will, but it has many layers to it in a way that our human mind cannot comprehend. Historically, just to give you some breadth here, uh, most theologians speak broadly of the two wills of God. His decreed will, or they might call it sometimes his decretive or sovereign or secret will. And then they also speak of his revealed will, that is his preceptive or expressed will as written in Holy Scripture, inescapable will. I mean, it's thou shalt not kill means thou shalt not kill. That's his revealed will. God's decreed will simply is this. Whatever God has planned or decreed will come to pass. Nothing in heaven or on earth or under the earth, no demon from hell, not even Satan himself can thwart God's decreed will. God's revealed will is the behavior he expects of his saints as expressed or as revealed in Holy Scripture. And so when we look at it this way, we, we see God's single will is unified, but it also contemplates these various means by which God accomplishes his set-in-stone will, if you will. I hope I haven't confused anyone, but let me give you an example. It is God's will expressed and revealed that you obey his commands perfectly and all the time. That's his revealed will. But you do not always obey them, do you? Your disobedience will cause you great misery, but it will not upend God's sovereign plan over human history or even God's sovereign plan over your own life. See, knowing God's will in every situation will lead to spiritual growth, but your disobedience is not going to upend the whole universe. God has contemplated all of these things in his multi-layered wills. So the question becomes, how can the saints know God's will in a given situation? If Paul were standing here before you in this pulpit, here's what he would say in, in short form. God's will is found in God's Word. His will is found in His Word. Paul confirms this in his earlier letters. That's why I say he would say that. Because in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he encourages those saints not to go beyond what is written. You go beyond what is written, you get into man's will. You stick with what is written, and you're squarely in God's will. In fact, his last words to Timothy he told him to preach the word. Why? Because Paul knew that God's will is found in God's word. See, the issue the Colossians were facing is that they were hearing all kinds of things about Jesus and, and God's will for their life. Uh, Jews were redefining Him. Gnostics were adding to Him. The mystics were hearing direct revelations from Him. And they were saying, who do we believe? Who are we to, to follow? And Paul says, the only way we know God's will for certain is to return to what he has written for his people. 
inner promptings, visions, personal experiences, all these things are subjective. No one can verify them. If you want to know God's will, God's will is found in His Word. And most of the time, it's fairly easy to discern. Sometimes, though, you might not be able to know it readily. In other words, sometimes God wants to season us a little bit uh, to grow us, and we bleed into our next point of growing. But things like, should I take this job offer or not? I have three colleges that have offered me scholarships. Which one should I go to? I wish we had a chapter in verse that says, go to the University of Alabama. That's where you should go. We don't have that verse. Amen. (laughs) Amen, says the Auburn fan. Or is that a state fan back there I hear? We just don't have that. You know, should I confront this brother or sister who's in sin, or should I let the Holy Spirit have a little bit of time to convince them on his own? What should I do? What's the timing? Should I, should I talk with this person today or next week? And what should I do in any given situation? What's God's will? And, and we don't always know that level of specificity. We know that it's improper for a man to marry a man and a woman to marry a woman. That's expressed. That's revealed. We know that sexual sin outside of marriage is improper. That's expressed. But some of these other things that we're not so sure, and that's where faith steps in. You need to search His Word so that your, your mindset is informed by Scripture, and Scripture gives you the guardrails by which you make those decisions. You need to pray diligently, and the Holy Spirit will give you some direction. You need to consult with your elders and other respected saints who might be outside the emotional aspect of your decision and can see things in a more unbiased point of view. You, you, need, you need to use these things, and that process will help clarify God's will. And sometimes, even after that, you still might not know. But that's where the growth is happening. That's where God is teaching you to trust more and more upon Him and less and less upon yourself. And that leads us into our second point. You must know the knowledge of His will is point number one. But then we go into you must grow the right way. It says in verse 9b, know the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Now, we all know people who twist God's Word for their own agendas, but Paul's prayer is that we grow in spiritual wisdom and spiritual understanding. So the knowledge that we just talked about is the factual content. You need to know the verses, memorize the verses, study the verses, get all of that rolling around in your brain. But there's something more. There is a spiritual wisdom which takes all of that factual content that is found in the book and principalizes it. It gives us a, a principle that we understand, okay, God has said this, and I understand what the principle underlying that command is. That's spiritual wisdom. But, but there's another step. It's got to come out of the brain and out of the heart, and it's got to come into the hands and feet. And that's spiritual understanding, understanding how to apply that wisdom. So you've got the knowledge You've got the wisdom, which reduces that knowledge to a principle, and then you've got the application in real life, and Paul calls that spiritual understanding in how to apply it. Christian saints need all of the above. We all know some of them who have the knowledge. They know every verse in the Bible. They They even know what man put in there. You know, man put the chapter and the verses in there, like the numbers. Some people know all the verses, and they know what man put in there too, the chapter divisions. And they can tell you everything, but they don't know the least thing about how to process that into wisdom. They don't know the least thing about how to apply it to everyday life. Paul didn't even at one point in his life. He was a a Pharisee. Pharisees have all the knowledge. They've got all the theology. They've got all of the verses but they don't have any idea. James read it from uh, Corinthians. They're blinded, 
even though they have the knowledge, they're blinded to the spiritual wisdom and the spiritual understanding on how to process and use that knowledge. It took a long time for the Apostle Paul to grow in grace. He says he went three years into the wilderness to consider these matters. And it may take a long time for you as well. In the meantime, just be patient, be humble, be kind. Don't think you know everything because you memorized one verse that somebody else hasn't memorized. Just keep reading, keep taking in Scripture, and then God will give you the spiritual wisdom and the spiritual understanding in due time. Since God's will is found in His Word, I want to give you one principle before we leave that will, that will keep you from going astray. It's a principle called the analogy of antecedent Scripture. He said the analogy of what? It's the analogy of antecedent Scripture. As I said, we all know people who will twist verses out of context and misapply them for their own gain or their own taste or their own preferences. Even in a third world country, we ran across a man named Javier who took one word out of Colossians, the word firstborn, and he created a whole new theology that Jesus was actually a created being which denies the Trinity and that it was through a created being that God created the world. He was a Jehovah's Witness. And this happens all the time. Had he learned the principle of the analogy of antecedent scripture, he wouldn't have gone down that track. What is it? It is this. The Bible must be interpreted as it was written. Forward, not backward. You see? For instance, it is unfair to take verses in the book of Revelation and impose them onto Paul in Colossians. Why? Because the book of Revelation had not been written when Paul wrote Colossians. It couldn't have informed his understanding. It couldn't have informed his thinking because it did not exist. And so we need to only look, when we're looking at Colossians as a letter, only look at those previous letters that Paul wrote because we know those informed his theology and even the Old Testament, because we know he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. But it won't do to take Revelation and put that over Paul. You say, well, it's one book. God wrote the whole book. Well, where do you stop with that? And that's where heresies arise, because everyone overlays anything they want. No, no. We hold ourselves to the analogy of antecedent Scripture because we want to understand God's will and the Colossians themselves didn't have the book of Revelation either. Many people don't realize, I didn't for the longest time. So when I say this, I'm, I'm right there in your camp. The books of the Bible are not written chronologically. They're not grouped chronologically. They're grouped thematically. You've got the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Then you've got the uh, prophets all those Isaiah, Hosea, all them. Then you've got the wisdom literature in one place. Then when you come into the New Testament, you've got the Gospels all together. You've got the letters that Paul wrote all together. And then you've got the book of Revelation, which is apocalyptic. But they're grouped uh, thematically, not chronologically. So you need to read the Bible chronologically to understand what each author was saying to his people in his time And then you look forward to the rest of the book. That's the analogy of antecedent scripture. And if people would apply that, then the heresies would begin to disappear rather quickly. So we need to grow. That's part of the growth process. That's why we have small groups and Sunday schools. And all of this is is to help us grow in the faith together. And then finally, we move to the last three verses where, where we go in the right way. So no the right way, grow in the right way, and then go in the right way. Verse 10a says, so as to walk, there's the key verb, in a manner worthy of the Lord, pleasing to the Lord. You say, man, you're just now getting to the controlling verb that you warned us about. We're going to be here all day. No, this goes rather quickly. All of the rest was prefatory. This will go rather quickly. Walking, in obedience day by day what does that look like four participles 
The first is bearing fruit. Bearing fruit. Jesus spoke about this when he spoke in terms of the vine and the branches in John 15, verse 5. But once, essentially what he's saying is once Christ plants his roots in your heart, then your fruit begins to align. You begin to bear fruit in a line with his will, with his desires, and with his passions. You remember that verse, don't you? I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, I will abide in him. That's what he's talking about. It's a grafting process. He grafts himself into your heart so that his heart and his passions become your heart and your passions. That's why it's not by works that a man is saved. It's by a changed heart with the fruit being the evidence that the root is in the tree. And so bearing fruit, and some of those fruits Paul names in an earlier letter, analogy of antecedent scripture, We're not imposing something on Paul. He's written this a few years ago. What are they? You remember Galatians. The fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, joy, all those good things. Patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Are these fruits evident in your life? They were in the Colossians. This isn't a negative passage. We're not chastising here. Paul was encouraging. He was saying these fruits are in your life, and that's evidence that Christ has planted his roots in your heart. The next participle, increasing in the knowledge of God. This is a lifelong process of bathing your mind in the Word of God so it becomes not merely what you believe, but it actually becomes who you are. That you're so brainwashed in Scripture that you don't think any otherwise than Scripture. I I was reading, and one of the great quotes of man comes from Charles Spurgeon, that great uh, London preacher from another generation, and he was talking about John Bunyan who preceded him in the faith. And he said, prick John Bunyan anywhere and you will find that his blood is bibbling. The very essence of the Bible flows out of him. He cannot speak without quoting a text, for his soul is full of the Word of God. That's what happens when the, the, the Scripture is in you and becomes a part of you, that it just comes out. I, I've made the suggestion, and everybody's not really on board with it yet, but I've made the suggestion that we go back to Ecuador Everybody's on board with that, but I've made the suggestion. They say, well, what are we going to do? We've got to do something. I say, well, how about we just go and do nothing? Do nothing? What do you mean? We've got to do something. No, how about we just go and we fellowship with those believers? We spend time with them in their home? Because if the Word is in us, the Word's going to come out of us. And we don't have to gather them together and sit them down and tell them you're going to listen to me as I I read this and talk to you. But but rather we just, our blood is bibbling. The Bible just flows out of us. I wonder if that would be a mission trip all in and of itself. I can't help but think of the one image if you saw the video of my daughter. And she has a half a dozen Ecuadorian girls around her. and They're just asking her questions about what is it like to be an American and live in America. And she's got the biggest smile on her face. Why? Because Jesus Christ is just flowing out of her. I imagine they asked her, you know, just something as simple as what time do you wake up in the morning? Oh, I wake up about six o'clock because I have to, I have to get into the scripture to hear what Christ says. Why? Because I'm going to a university that's secular and I'm going to hear what the world says when I go to all of these classes and I need to filter that through what Christ says. That's your blood being bibbling. That's the Bible just flowing out of you. That's Christ flowing out of you. And it all comes because the knowledge of the Lord is increasing in us. So we need to take in much Scripture so that we breathe out much Scripture. The third participle is being strengthened with all power. When I saw that word strengthen, I thought of the Incredible Hulk, and I like the 80s one with David Banner, where in the the preview he picks up a car and he throws it down in a ditch. But that's not the kind of power he's talking about. 
He's talking about spiritual power to withstand demonic attacks. Have you ever come to the end of yourself and you just had no energy? And you just felt the Lord's strength pushing you forward? I saw it with my own eyes yesterday. I saw a man at a funeral who had lost his wife of some 52, 53 years. And he was grieving. He was heartbroken. He was spent. He, he couldn't even lift his arms up. He was so weary. And I just watched as that worship service went on and the Lord just pushed him through it and gave him the strength to press through that funeral service. I saw him being strengthened with the Lord's power. There was nothing he could conjure up. There, he, he had no willpower left. It was all gone. And the Holy Spirit just pushed him through. And, and, and though he was grieving, he had a smile on his face. Though he was grieving, though he was hurting, he just kept moving forward. That's being strengthened with all power. And then the last... A uh, participle there is giving thanks, and it brings it full circle. All of our going is for God's glory, not our own. We're going to gather together at 5 o'clock tonight. We're not going to talk about how glorious we were or how wonderful our messages and our talks were. We're going to be talking about how glorious God was, how God showed up, how God gave the increase, how God encouraged those saints, how God did it all. And that's going to be what we do. We're giving thanks now, I'll be honest, if you read this verse, he says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Giving thanks for the inheritance. He didn't say give thanks for the Ford F-150 with 212,000 miles that I drive every day, although I thank him for that. I'm glad to have a chariot, so to speak. Or, or other things. But here's where I'm going to be honest. Most of the times when I give thanks to the Lord, I'm thanking Him for things that are very earthy. For, for, the, for, for, for tangible assets. That's just the way my mind thinks because I can see them and feel them and touch them. Thank Him for my truck. I thank Him for the house that I live in. I thank Him for the cup of coffee that I drink. I, I've got a ye little Yeti cup. I thank Him for my Yeti cup because it keeps it warm for me. I thank Him for all kinds of things. But is this is what He's talking about here? Is this what He says? He says to give thanks for the inheritance. What is the inheritance? Well, Paul doesn't tell us right here. But in the companion letter, Ephesians, he goes into great detail. You got to keep in mind, Colossians and Ephesians were folded up and they were carried in the same pouch by the same messenger to give to the respective churches. So they, they traveled for hundreds of miles together in a saddleback pouch, probably. And in that other letter, he, he explains the inheritance in unmistakable terms. He says, Part of our inheritance is full and free forgiveness of sins. Now you just think about that. Every sin you have ever committed or will commit is freely taken away. That's the inheritance. He talks in terms of the riches of grace. He talks in terms of eternal life, not eternal destruction, which is what we deserve. He talks in terms of a glorified state. And maybe best of all, he talks in terms of being seated alongside Christ's throne with our enemies under our feet. That's our inheritance. No sin anymore. Uh, the tempter who has tempted us and enticed us in so many ways by our own desires is under our feet. He's gone forever. He, 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 he has been defeated. We have no tension in life. We will have no stress in life. We will not have people putting us in uncomfortable positions anymore. We won't have to worry about anybody's feelings because everyone will treat one another perfectly. We get all of that. That's the inheritance. And that speaks nothing of the eternal land, the eternal peace, and the eternal throne which God promised King David way back in 2 Samuel 7. These are the things we ought to be giving thanks for. And I just stand and confess to you, 
I give thanks for those things many times. I heard Scott Riley give thanks for Christ's imputed righteousness in our small group time, and that, that thrilled me because he's doing what this verse says to do, give thanks for the spiritual. And it's not that we, we don't like what God's given us. I love my house. Many of you know it's hard to get me out of my house. I told someone yesterday, it's very rare I leave the city limits of Springville because I love this place but I love my heavenly home better. And I ought to thank him for that more often than I do. Maybe you should too. So we've come to the end of it. Know him, grow in him, and go for him. And we go for him in those four participle ways. But this might be a good time for each of us to pause and ask, am I truly bearing fruit? Again, it's not condemning. This is positive. The Colossians were. I look out and I see many of you, and I see the fruits that you bear. And so this is more reflective. Yes, I am bearing fruit. How could I bear more fruit? Another question, am I increasing in the knowledge of God? And all of us are. I look at you and, and I, see, I see students. You know, our church has been described as the church of the Bereans, because they don't trust everything that comes out of the pulpit. They judge it against what God has said in the Word. And we love that uh, about this congregation. But is there more that you could do? All of us have a little streak of laziness in us, don't we? Is, is there more you could pack in? Is there a sermon that you could listen to uh, going to and fro rather than filling your mind with other things? Is there another place where you could add more? Am I being strengthened to fight life's weary battles with joy, or do I fight them with a frown? Am I giving thanks for my spiritual inheritance regularly, or am I giving thanks for things like my good health? One is good, the other is better. You see? And let's thank Him for both. And if there's any of these areas where we could do better, today is God's little reminder for us to Tighten the bolt a little bit. Tighten the belt a little bit. And let's get busy doing the things of the Father's business. Read God's Word every day. Pray His Word. See, that's where the wisdom comes. Read it to get it in there. And then pray it so it processes itself into spiritual wisdom. Let your speech be bibbling, as it were. Listen to gospel-centered sermons from gospel-charged men. Listen to Paul Washer. It's easy now. They've got little six-minute clips. You don't even have to listen to the whole thing. You can just get a six-minute dose on the way to the doctor's office or somewhere. Listen to Steve Lawson. Listen to Alistair Begg. Listen to Chuck Swindoll. Some people like him. I was listening uh, very briefly to Adrian Rogers. I don't agree with everything of Adrian Rogers, but he's a gospel pastor who's now in heaven. And he's got golden pipes that just speak biblical truth. Listen, saturate yourself with these things. Surround yourself with Christian saints. You know, one way that wisdom processes itself is you, sometimes, this is the, the honest truth, sometimes I will spend eight hours a day or more studying God's Word. It's wonderful. And it's all right here. And then I'll go to a lunch after church with someone and everything that I'm studied pops to life. The fellowship with the saints is discipleship. That's not an event that we do. That is discipleship. And I think in our busyness of our schedules, oftentimes we cut ourselves short or sell ourselves short because we don't commune with the saints. We commune with the world. We commune with other people, but we don't commune with the saints. And that's what God uses to, to bring us to life to His Word. Saturate yourself with all of these things, and they will act like water, watering the root of your heart, and then the fruits will come. You won't have to pray for them to come. You won't have to, to work for them to come. You give it a little water, and the fruits blossom. So let's do that more and more. Encouraging message, not condemning, but just think about your life and where you could improve and then give yourself a pat on the back while you're at it. Because I've been to a lot of churches. 
and I've never been to one like this. This is a good group of gospel saints. Not perfect, but a group that desires to follow Christ, to know Him, to grow in Him, and to go for Him. So I'm so thankful to be called one of you. Let's pray. Father, we